First of all, I'd like to thank Kate Heidi for coming Hi. To, to see you. She's here to talk about Paris College of Art and international recruitment from art colleges. Okay? If you've got any questions today, feel free to ask anything. And thank you to all of you for coming as well. Well, I've got a microphone here, so I'm okay, but I shall uh, just encourage you guys to ask me questions, especially as there's not too many of you, which is nice for me because I get a bit intimidated by big groups. Um, please just interrupt me whenever you want, ask any questions, no matter how big or small you might think they will be. So um, I, um, I'm actually an alumni of Paris College of Art. I graduated about three years ago from their fine arts program, and uh, I've been living in Paris, and now I'm living back in London, and I work with students... Um, both students that are applying to our university as well as students in high schools all around the country, just helping them with their portfolio building, what to put into their applications, and also just discussing the different options that there are for universities um, abroad, mainly. So, obviously, I've studied in Paris, I've also studied in London, um, and I've studied in New York. So, any questions about the cities, anything, just feel free to ask me. I can give you sort of first-hand opinion. Um, so, I'll start talking a little bit about us. Um, we are a very small university, we're about the same size as you guys, I'd say about 250 students. Um, we're based in the centre of Paris in the glass looking building here, um, which is really nice, we just moved there about a year ago. Um, it's a nice big campus, got lovely views of Paris, um, and it's, it's not a live on site campus, so students live all over Paris, we help them find houses, it's a very vibrant university life. And like I said, it's quite small, so we benefit from having small classes, and we are completely international. So we have students from over 60 different nationalities within that number of students, and that's quite unique. To have a small international university is quite rare. And one of the biggest selling points for us is that our university is English-speaking. So even though we're in Paris, everything is taught in English. 90% of our professors are bilingual, French and English. Most of them live and work in France, but are from other countries. And I would say most of them have a third language as well. And so it's quite a unique environment. For myself, it was uh, a really exciting opportunity. So we, um, we provide quite a unique experience, and, and I will talk a little bit about the different opportunities there are for university in terms of studying in the UK and also in America. But because we're an American university in Paris, we're somewhere in between the two. And so what we do is we utilise all of the spaces around us. So we work with... Um, has anyone been to Paris? Raise your hands. Yeah. Oh, there's quite a few of you. All right, okay. Did you like it? <laughs> yeah, nod heads. Nice. Um, I mean, I really love Paris. I'm half French, so that was a kind of clear reason for me to go there. But um, there are loads of countries all over the world where you can find um, different universities, and that's sort of what I'm here to encourage you to think about, um, using our university as a vehicle um, to kind of expose what those opportunities can be. So we use different studios in and around the city as well as our own campus. So printmaking studios, we use the Decorative Arts Museum Library, which is unique. We're the only undergraduate program with access to that library. We use the Pompidou Centre and their library, which is a resource for university students. Um, and you'll find that a lot of different um, American schools will actually expose you to different resources around the city when you're studying at them. And also, English universities as well, and these are the kind of things you should be looking for when you're looking at a possible university that you might be interested in studying at. Don't just look at the degree. Look at all the other stuff that they offer you. Look at the connections with libraries, with gallery spaces, um, the exhibitions that they put on, the careers opportunities that they have, and I'll talk a bit more about that after this. Um, and these are the things that are really important in your degree, not just the quality of teaching, which of course is the most important thing, but all the other stuff around that. Um, our university specifically offers 10 degrees. They're four years in length. Each one starts with a first year that's called a foundation. It's a little bit different to a UK foundation, and I'll talk about that just in a minute. Um, and then that's followed by three years of your chosen degree. So we offer fine arts, fashion design, photography, illustration, design management. Um, that's when I get lost. Communication design, interior design, industrial design, and accessories design, as well as uh, art history, theory, and criticism. So there's quite a broad range of degrees for a small university. Um, if anyone is interested in a specific degree, obviously, maybe at the end of the talk, please feel free to come and talk to me if you've got any questions. Um, so I'll just show you a, a few images of the work that we do. And throughout those degrees, so you start in the first year with a foundation, and in an American university, which is what we are, the degree is American, you have the whole of that first year to experiment. So you do a bit of everything. You do a bit of design, a bit of photography, a bit of textiles, a bit of painting, a bit of 3D, literally a bit of everything. And the whole point of that first year is to allow students to be exposed to a variety of skills to help them make the best possible decision 
of which degree they should go into. Because once you start on a degree track for the following three years, you're really starting to get involved in work experience and doing projects with companies. And you really want it to be in the area of study that you're most interested in and that you're best at. So having that whole first year to experiment is, is, is really important. And what you'll find, for example, in an English university, when you do a foundation in the UK, it's a separate year and you apply for that program as it is for one year and then when you finish that year or halfway through that year you then reapply for your three-year degree. What that means is that whilst you still get to experiment in a few of the areas you don't necessarily get as much time to try all of the different things. You get, I did my foundation in the UK um, and I had about two weeks in each section for about eight weeks and then I had to decide because I had to start building my portfolio to reapply for the next three years of my degree. I didn't know what I wanted to do, I made the wrong decision and it ended up in six months of complete turmoil and trying to decide what I wanted to do. It's very stressful and I wish I'd been to a university that maybe had given me a bit more time to figure it out. So it's important to think, you know, it is possible for you guys to study abroad and that the option is slightly different. The foundation programme in an American university is incorporated into the four years. So once you're in, you're in and you don't have to decide what you want to do until halfway through that first year or towards the end of that first year. So that's quite exciting. Um, does anyone have any questions about that, the differences in foundation programmes? No? Nobody? Okay. I'll assume that it was interesting enough. Yeah? Um, if you're applying for a fine arts degree and then you do foundation and you decide that you say you want to go into photography, can you change after yeah. that? When you apply, you actually just apply as a foundation applicant. So you don't have, oh. to, in, you don't have to imply what you want to study further on in your degree in that original application. And you can even do the foundation there and then you could do that, that would be called a transfer because you would be leaving the school, but it's totally possible and it's what I did the other way around. So I did my foundation here and then I transferred into an American university in the second year, so straight into a fine arts programme. So I skipped their foundation, do you see what I mean? So there's loads of different ways to do it. Um, yeah, so and it's good to ask questions about those kinds of things. So when you apply to an American university, you apply with a general portfolio and you know, that's another topic, but, we, but you, you, know, you can put in anything you want, basically. It's not like when you apply for a foundation in the UK where they have slightly stricter requirements for what you have to include in your application. So there's a few differences also in how you apply. Um, so, we, so we sort of obviously help students through advising, talking to the teachers, trying to encourage them to look at what their, where their skills are. Maybe they thought they wanted to do fashion, but they've changed and they want to do communication design and media, something like that. So we do really help and support students in that benefits us because we're a small university, much like yourselves here. Um, I think I'm getting to the last image. So, I mean, that's really the crux of our university. Um, it's not dissimilar from the sort of structure that you guys have. Um, and it is very much about building confidence, building an individual student, helping you develop, um, and encouraging you to use the resources around you. So whether that means, you know, say you guys decided you wanted to apply to a university in San Francisco, or a university in Sweden, a university in Paris like us, um, of which there are English-speaking universities in all of those countries, um, in countries all over the world. Um, all of those universities are going to be different sizes, offer you different things, and, I, and, and what I try to help students to see is, is the things you should be looking for. So, you know, what is the structure of the degree? What do they give you in terms of exposure, experience, careers help, and all those kinds of things. And the one last thing I'll mention about universities, and we chatted a little bit about this before, we, before I started the talk, um, not a lot of students know about um, exchange and study abroad. So when you study at a university, and University of Arts London does this, we do this, all American universities do this, in your third year of study, so you've got four years, foundation and three years of your degree, in your third year of study, you can do a study abroad year, and that's with one of the exchange schools that that university has. So for example, if you came to study with us for four years, you could come to Central St. Martins for a year. You would have to send them your portfolio, but it's a 99% acceptance rate when you're doing an exchange programme. So unless you're an absolutely terrible student, you're going to be able to go and do that study abroad year. And we, this is our map. It doesn't blow up very well, but you get an idea, you know, that the circle in the middle is Paris. We work with universities all over the world, and this map is actually a year old, so we have about 10 new universities on there. American universities work again the same way they have international schools all, all over the world that you can exchange to and um, even UK universities do this they have slightly fewer numbers of exchange options but they do offer it um, and at the moment only about 20% of their students take advantage of it but it is increasing it's a wonderful opportunity to study somewhere new experience a new culture goes on your CV meet new people make new contacts I mean the list of, of 
pluses is endless to doing something like this. So when you go and look at a university, look at their study abroad options. Look at where else you might be able to study during those four years if that's something you wanted to do. Does anyone have any questions about that? Um, usually, what year would the people take the year to exchange to another country? It'd be the third year. That's so right. would be... Is there something? Oh, sorry. Um, oh, okay. And there would be um, the first foundation year, your first year of your specialised degree, so let's say it's fashion. Then the next year, your third year of the four years of your degree, that's the year that you would study abroad. Um, so you, in all universities, you have to do your final year at the university you're graduating from. Um, and some students often ask me if they can do two years of study abroad, so two and two. It is possible. Um, it would have to be your second and third years of study because, again, you have to be back in your graduating university in the final year. And that's often, in our case, it's often for students that maybe have a family problem, maybe they need to go back to where their families are from for two years. Um, and we're very, uh, I'm trying to think of the English word, uh, helpful. Um, there's a better word in French for that. Helpful at aiding students to, to be where they need to be and at the best possible university that they can be at. Um, you know, if you have no reason to need to go somewhere else and the opportunities and lists are endless. So if you were a communication design student and you were particularly interested in animation, I know for a fact that there are three specific universities on this list that are the three top universities in the world for animation, better than we are. So which ones are there? Are you interested in animation? Yeah. So St. St. Martin's particularly good. Yeah. And Kingston University, so that's two in England. And the other one that's really good is, yeah, is on this list. It's um, the Melbourne Sydney College of the Arts. It's particularly good for animation. Um, also, all of the universities in America do have strong animation programs, but it's quite exciting to go somewhere that's specifically renowned for, for animation and illustration. So we, you know, this... If you pick to go abroad for a year, is that the whole year? Or the whole study year? It, it normally is. Some, some universities will let you do it for six months. Um, we prefer students to go for a full year, because six months is really just three months of study. Yeah. And, and, and whilst that's still really beneficial, and it might be all you can do, let's say you have to be in a country for a certain amount of time or, or you have visa, visa restrictions or anything like that. It's not normally an issue, but sometimes it happens. Then six months is possible, but we would encourage a year normally just to get the most out of it. Yeah. Any other questions about that? No? Okay. Um, well, that's just the last picture. I don't know why I put that in after that map. I should put it in before. It looks really random now. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, careers because we decided, you know, me and Mr. McCall decided that it was probably the most interesting thing to talk about this evening. So when I started at university, um, this is the only page I think that I have with writing on it. I tried desperately not to put lists of writing on projections because I find it really boring, but I'll be as interesting as I can to balance it out. So when I was looking at universities, I was so concerned with my degree, um, in particular being a fine artist, I wanted to find a degree that I could do everything. I didn't want to specialise in painting or sculpture or printmaking for the whole of my degree, I wanted to do everything. And there are literally five universities in the world that do that, trust me, it took me a long time to find one, this being one of those schools. And I completely discarded any concern for what I might do at the end of my degree. Being a fine artist, it's probably at the bottom of the list of degrees where you think about jobs. Um, so I'm quite a good example of someone who maybe should have paid more attention. I'm lucky I ended up in a school that's particularly good for careers. But in hindsight, I should have been thinking about it. And it's it's actually the most exciting thing because universities now, I mean, 10 years ago, seven years ago when I was looking, universities didn't offer as much help with careers and work experience um, and lectures and things like this. They didn't do that. Now, most universities are just full of opportunities for you to get involved in the professional world. And it's the first, really for me, it's the first thing you should be looking at. How exposed will you be as a student? And so this, for me, was kind of the list of things I think are really important in terms of how a university can help you as a student and getting a job after you graduate, which is it's really what we're all looking for, especially at the moment. Um, confidence, it sounds so silly, and looked at, looking at it out there, it looks even sillier, but not everybody is sort of born with the confidence to sell their own work. Some people are really, really good at what they do, but selling it, selling yourself, which is what you have to do as an artist and a designer, is actually the hardest thing for some people. It's so difficult. And I've seen it in students that have come into our university and, and not necessarily had that confidence and they've left really knowing what they're good at. And that is a product of one-on-one -on -one time with your tutors, of small class sizes, of being in a close environment where you feel like you're allowed to become an individual. Um, and so if that's, you know, if you feel that, that you, maybe you're that kind of person, looking at a small university can be really, really helpful. 
And if you're already quite confident, again, you should still be looking for a university that's going to allow you to shine and going to allow you to, to be an individual um, and to really sort of own your work. So confidence is something that you should gain or develop at university because that's what you're going to need when you graduate. Um, and I came across a really interesting statistic the other day um, that said we were looking at how people find jobs. And at first look, it looked really daunting. We basically found that 75% of jobs in the art and design fields were found through networking, which looks so scary because you're like, networking? That, I, can't put a, I can't put that in a box. How do I define networking? Um, but actually, it's, it's, it's quite exciting because what that means is it's you. It's you as a person. It's you when you meet people, when you go to a party, when you go to a dinner, when you go to the pub, when you, when you go to a lecture. It's you having a chat with someone. That's where I found 90% of my jobs. As a painter, you kind of expect it. But even in all of the other areas, that's where the jobs come from. It's, you know, standing outside, waiting for somebody, picking up a conversation. It, it really is 75%. It's a massive amount of it. So confidence, you know, it, it goes, it's one and one. It goes hand in hand. Um, and just to sort of finish that statistic, 12% were online and paper advertisements. 8% were through actual... Um, how would you call it, uh, agencies, helping you find a job. And the last 5% were cold calling, showing up and asking for a job. So you're really, you're, you're really the bulk of it is you. You are your, your self-PR, you are the person selling yourself. So the next thing, obviously, is experience. How can a university help you with experience? We do it in two ways. We have professionals come into the university, giving lectures, giving talks, doing projects, and then work experience whilst you're studying. That's the most important thing. We really, really help. I mean, last year, 60% of our students did work experience placement. 60%, that's massive. And universities, you should ask them, what percentage of your students do work experience before they graduate? And it should be above 30%, even in a large university. And I've been to a million universities all over the world, and I've seen the value that that has. Um, I know for a fact that University of Arts London is really supportive now with work experience, and they do have above that percentage. So you, it's really important to look for it. Um, exposure is not just having gallery shows and having exhibitions and catwalk shows. It's also, you know, do they create events where you can meet people? Do you go to libraries? Do you go to different spaces and places? Are you being exposed to the world around you outside of university? Study abroad, I already talked about it. It's just a great opportunity to meet new people. It looks great on your CV. You've got something to say when you strike up a conversation with someone. It's just such a fantastic selling point. So already if you, for example, came to study with us in Paris and then you went to, I don't know, Lebanon to study for a year or something like that, it, it just looks great and it, and it makes you a more well-rounded person. Um, workshops. It's the last thing really is uh, what we do, and I, I think most universities do do this now, is give you workshops on resume writing. How do you write a resume? What are the different career fields looking for? Um, what do they want you to say? What do they want you to, to do? It's, it, you need insider knowledge when you go for an interview. Let's say we set you up with an interview. We're going to help you. We're going to say, look, this is what, how they want you to be. This is what they're looking for. You need to, to show them you can do this, this, and this. This is how you write a good resume. This is how you build a good portfolio. These are not things you should know how to do. These are things that your university should be helping you with. This is not something you should ever have to do alone, ever. And I feel really passionately about that because the amount of help that gave us as students is just invaluable. And without that, I think it would have taken me a lot longer to really settle into my professional career after graduating. So that you should really be looking for. And asking them, when you go and visit a university, ask them these questions. Ask them if they have these things because it makes you look really savvy. And it's also something you need to know. So... That's the end of my list. The last thing was just alumni, but also that's all of those things continued after you graduate. All universities do alumni stuff. But I think if you haven't had the help whilst you're studying, once you graduate, it's, 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 it's not so much help anyway. So um, I've already shown you that picture. We were, I mean, I'm just going to scroll through a few examples of those things I've just talked about. Does anyone have any questions before I start boring you with images? I would uh, go to Paris and do a foundation and move to Australia to do uh, a degree. Okay, so yeah, again, that would be... Oh, do you need to say that again with the microphone? <laughs> um, I think you need to say the question again. Uh, yeah, can I move to... Well, am I meant to speak into this? Or is it all right? Yeah, can I go to Paris for foundation and then like, move to Australia for three years and do the degree? Yeah, that's possible. It's like I said before, it's a transfer. So it's basically what I did in reverse. So, so you did your foundation programme with us, you applied to us, 
um, you would need to sort of make that decision about halfway through that first year because, of course, you would need to reapply. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but you totally can, yeah. I mean, it's the thing that no one ever said to me that I wish someone had is that even though when you go to university, obviously, you know, university now is expensive, even in the UK, often you need the help from your parents to pay to get through it. And a lot of people feel like they make a decision and they have to stick with it. But if you're investing that money or if your parents are investing that money in, in you, you should really make the right decision for you. If that means transferring or changing or moving countries, you should do it. And you should have a university that obviously is going to help you make those decisions as easily and as confidently as possible. But it's your education at that point. You're not in high school anymore. It's, it's, it's you. It's your decision. And I know that from first-hand experience because I went through a, a quite a sort of difficult time making those moves. So there's much more support now. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> um, any other questions? Oh, good question. Oh, I have to say it again. <laughs> what if you can't speak French when you go to the... To, to France? Yeah. yeah, well, I didn't speak French when I arrived in France, which is even more embarrassing considering I'm French, so imagine. Um, it doesn't matter. The, the most important thing, obviously, with us is that the studies aren't in French. It's not going to impede your study. But what we do offer, obviously, are French classes. And in the first year, they are part of the course unless you already speak French and you're placed based on your level. You don't have to take them. You can opt out of them. But I would say 95% of our students take them that don't already speak French. Um, you pick it up pretty quickly. I didn't take French classes because I transferred. And then they forgot to ask me. And I forgot to ask if I could take them <laughs> um, and, um, because it wasn't part of my curriculum. And I just learned it from being there, to be quite honest. It took me two years. And then I was. And I'm fluent now, but it's five years later now. Is it hard to live there if you, if you don't speak French? They always reply in English even if you try and speak it, French anyway. Exactly. You just answer the question for me. But if it's Paris. I mean, sorry. I mean, Paris, everybody speaks English. Everyone. And they talk to you in English even if you try and talk to them in French. Until you're, It took me three years for people to start replying to me in French. That was like the best day ever. Or to be able to do phone calls in French about like your bills and things like that. That's really scary. But it does come... And people are pretty friendly. It's an international city. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not scary at all. And um, what we, d we do help students when they arrive, because, you know, we have students with varied levels of English, as you can imagine, when they arrive, because we have students coming from all over the world. So for some students, French isn't even the issue. It's just speaking English and French. And we really have a lot of support for students. Most international universities, of which there aren't that many, will offer you support, you know, things like how do you settle into a city, how do, you, how do you set up your internet, how do you, you know, get an apartment, how do you do all these things. You know, we do that before you've even started studying. And you should ask that from any university that you're going to if it's abroad, if it's a different language. Like if you're in America or Australia, you're okay. And they'll offer you sort of student life support, but it, not necessarily language support, but yeah. I think most places will ease you into the language. I had a friend that went to study in Shanghai on her study abroad year, literally didn't speak a word of Chinese. I'm not kidding, nothing. And the university is Chinese, they have an international body, but you can imagine, like in the class it's fine, and then the class finishes and it's like, my God, I have no idea what's going on. She just took Chinese classes and threw herself into it and came back literally speaking pretty, pretty well in Chinese. It was amazing. That's like, can you imagine having that in addition to having your study abroad experience? You sort of got to throw yourself into it. Yeah, well, and the same person might go and not come back speaking Chinese, but have just as good of an experience. So, you know, each student is different, but the opportunities are there. That's sort of my point. Yeah, but French, don't worry so much about it. You'll pick it up if you come. Um, any other questions? Oh, yeah. about the recommendations. Yeah. Um, as you say, <laughs> Uh, about the recommendation, you said the school is in central Paris, <laughs> right? So do you actually have like a specific school halls or, school halls or anything. to settle your student there? Um, we don't have halls because we're not a campus university, but we only have 250 students thereabouts. So what we do is we do have halls that are, for example, we have one that we share with the American University in Paris, um, which is the only other English speaking school in Paris. <laughs> so yeah, there's only two. Um, and there's only one art one in the whole of France, and that's us. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Like you can imagine, we're quite sort of concentrated. So we have students that choose that option, but actually, I would say, in terms of percentiles, 
of our intaking years, we have about 90 new students each year. I'd say about 20 of them find their own housing. They want to find an apartment, or they've got family there, or they've got a friend that they want to live with. They, they sort themselves out, we offer them help, but they're okay. I'd say about 50 students want to find an apartment, either with another student, and we can pair you up, or with someone they know, or on their own. And the rest of the students want to be in our housing options, like with the American University in Paris. But for all of those students, we have a massive amount of help. We accept students Basically, our deadline is rolling all the way through the year. Priority is in February, but you can continue to apply up until the end of July. Otherwise, it gets a bit late in terms of getting visas if someone needs it or getting housing. But we're there all of August, which I might add no one else in France is because France shuts down in August and it's literally me and the five other people in my office working, trying to get everything ready for students to arrive. And that is, is there to help students find housing and things like that. So even if it's last minute, there's still help. And it's, it's quite nice. Like, I, I, I preferred living in an apartment. Um, I went out with my friends for dinner. We went over to each other's houses. We went out to concerts. It, you're out all the time. You're in the city. Paris is small. Um, and actually, you know, it's, it's not in the middle of nowhere. It's not a campus university for a reason, because you should be ex experiencing the city. And you grow up really quickly in a good way. Like, you sort of just throw yourself into to, to living as an adult. And, it's a fantastic experience. I think it really helps our students. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Do you need the microphone? <laughs> Got it before you said it this time. Yes. <laughs> there was some mention of scholarships. Yes. Before the talk. Yeah. You didn't yeah. mention those at all. No, no, I haven't mentioned it yet. Well, mainly because I was talking about careers and I didn't want to like segue it in. But actually, it's something that's a really good question. So. Scholarships are really interesting because in American universities, it's obviously something that's offered to a great bulk of the students. Um, private universities have a lot more funding because the fees are higher, which means the scholarships are better. Um, funnily enough, now in England, it's quite expensive now to study. I mean, when I studied in the UK, it was free, and now it's not. It's about £9,000, and there aren't scholarship opportunities, or there aren't as many scholarship opportunities in the UK. In American universities, you can normally get full scholarships, um, in the US, mostly in the US, um, or half scholarships, and they have ones for English students and ones for, for international students and all these different options. For us, it's really simple. One scholarship opportunity, all students can apply, and it's based on how much you need, and you fit, whoever's paying the bills will fill out a financial need form, and also on the merit of your application, so the quality of your portfolio, your grades, and your personal statement. So, so if it's good, you might get it. You get a higher percentage. Well, we give, I, actually 50% of our students have some form of financial aid, which is a massive amount. Again, it's a small university, but 50% is still good. Um, the maximum we offer is 50% of the tuition fees, which is a lot. Um, school isn't as expensive as in the US because it's in euros. So for example, this year if you pay full fees, I'm going to throw numbers out now and it's probably going to sound really intimidating and you won't remember it, but it's about 26,000 euros a year. It's a lot of money. but. Spit it in half, 13,000 euros. Put that into pounds, 10,000 pounds. It's basically what you pay to study here. And you're getting a private education in a class size of about five to 10 to 12 students, um, five days a week, support on the weekends, and all of the things I've been talking about, which you do not get in a UK university to a certain extent in the same amount. So what you're paying for, you're really getting a lot more for your money. So scholarship is really, really important. For me, it was the only way I could study at this university. I had a 50% scholarship. So it's, um, we encourage all students that think they might need it to at least apply for it. And you do it as soon as your application materials are submitted. You can then complete that form. And we give a student an answer about their place. And then within two weeks, two weeks, you'll get an answer about how much scholarship we can offer you. And that will be, you can contest that once if you think you need more and you'd really like to accept your place. Um, it's quite a fair system. Um, there's not that many universities that do it like that, so it's important to ask how it works, how much there might be for you, how you would apply, how quickly you would know. Does that help? Yeah? When are all the application deadlines for this? For different universities? For, the, the Paris moment, you know. for us, it's like I said, it's rolling. Um, because we're small, we try to do every application one-on-one, -on -one, so... Priority deadline, and priority deadline for universities means if you're accepted and you applied before that deadline, you have a place. If you apply after that deadline and you're accepted but the course is full, then you're on a waiting list. 
It doesn't happen that often. I mean, you'd have to apply in like July for it to be full normally because we're very selective with our students and we always get the right number of students and good students. So we're quite good at it, but larger universities will have a waiting list program. Um, so they will accept maybe more students than they can take because they're taking in classes of like a thousand. So it's a very different process. So their deadlines might be more strict. Um, UK deadlines are obviously much earlier. They're normally January. Um, like I said, ours is February. It's best to just apply before February and get it out of the way. Unless you're waiting on a project that you really want to finish, that you really want to be in your portfolio or something that you think is really going to get you that place, then, you know, mention that and say that's why you applied after the priority deadline. Um, yeah? US universities all have different deadline dates. So every single university is a bit different. You need to just check on their website. Any other questions? Sorry, one more. Go for it. No, no. It's um, nice to have questions. Uh, about the school area, like, mm -hmm. uh, do we have to share, like, studios and workspace? Okay. And is it kind of, you know, like, do they, like, fight about it? Or is it kind <laughs> of, you know? Um, we have a lot more space now than we had when I was a student. Um, our new campus is big. Um, there's more than enough space and we're expanding every year. So we have basically four floors of a five floor building. We get the next floor next year and then we get another building the year after because we're introducing new degrees. The classes won't be getting bigger. The classes will still be an average of eight to ten students, but there will be more op options. Um, so you don't really have to fight over space. Although I do have to say that at the moment, fine arts students don't have an individual studio each for their final year we have one studio for the final year of fine arts students. And there are, my graduating year was five, so I was really lucky, we were teeny tiny. And we had a space about twice the size of this room for five people, it's a lot of space. Yeah. It's a lot of space, so we were lucky. Um, and this year I think they've got a little bit less space, but they've got about five or six students as well. So it's, it's still enough, but I think they would like to have more space. But everybody else, there's three computer labs, um, dark rooms, photo labs, everything is, is there that you need and everything, I mean it's a small school, you've got more than enough space for each student. I haven't seen any fights break out yet. Okay. But like, it's a new campus, so you never know. <laughs> yeah? But we have to bring our own materials. Um, do you want to say it again? What about materials? <laughs> um, it depends on the course. Um, obviously, yes the bulk of your materials you provide once you're at university and that goes for all universities with the exception of, for example, in foundation they give you, we actually provide our students with a foundation pack which includes drawing materials, paper, um, a folder for carrying your work in and out of the studio and taking it home if you wanted to work at home for example. Um, and we do that in the first year and then after that you pretty much have to get everything yourself. It's a good question because, for example, fine arts, they have clay. They have the kind of cheaper materials there for you. They have all the tools. Um, photography has all of the chemicals and everything there for you, but if you wanted to do liquid light or you wanted to do screen printing with like photo transfers or anything really specific, you might have to buy those materials yourself. And we have discounts with all of the stores in the area, so it's really nice. You get 20 to 30% discount on photo materials, which is so expensive and fashion textiles harder to get discounts on fashion textiles but we do our best because obviously students can be quite specific about what materials they want one of my friends used fish skin in her final piece and we had to go to this really creepy place outside paris and i didn't want to go inside because it smelled really weird and she spent a lot of money on fish skin um but she won the award for the best collection so i guess it paid off um so it, it depends um so it can be expensive and that's another reason why scholarship can be really helpful. One other thing I'll say is that as a university, and I don't know if other universities do this, but we offer on-campus internships. So what that is, is the, s the school basically employs you. It means you don't have to go out and get a part-time job if you feel you need cash flow for things like, you know, living expenses and materials. Um, you work on campus with your department. I worked on the front desk. I was their secretary in the evenings. It let, let me stay on campus late. Um, I didn't have to go anywhere for work. I had a proper contrat, the stage, payment contract official. I was getting paid per month, and that basically covered all of my food and materials costs. It wasn't enough for my rent, but it covered everything else. Um, and those internships are based on, um, again, how good your application was. So if you were a good student, we're more likely to offer you a, a better internship in the, in the school. That's quite a unique thing. I'm not sure if many schools do that. Um, and it's really nice not having to go 
like I did when I was in London, I was working in a bar, and it was just such hard work. Like I was painting from like 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. and then sleeping and then working, and it was just stressful. And working on the university was just much nicer. So, um, any other questions? No. I'm going to go through these bits really quickly because we've been talking for a while. But um, just that these are a few of the things that we offer. So we work with the Chateau de Versailles. They have a research centre. It's really nice. Um, sometimes I just go there to see what people are doing because I like to hang around in the chateau and it's just quite cool. Um, we work with the Ecole Lesage that does all of Chanel's embroidery. Um, we work again with the Decorative Arts Museum, I showed you that. Um, every year we have a class president. So last year it was Christian Louboutin and they come at the beginning of the year, they do a design challenge, they work with the students throughout the year, we have an exhibition and then they give the degrees to the graduating students and they do this sort of speech at our graduation which is in a really fancy hotel, it's really nice. So that was Christian Louboutin, he did um, Aesthetics of the Nude, that was our um, project. I don't have any pictures of the project though because they wouldn't load on my computer this morning, I'm really sorry. Um, this year it's Jarvis Cocker, he actually lives opposite my friend in Paris, it's really cool. Um, and I, when he came to, to work I did not mention that because it makes me sound a bit creepy. But um, he's, he's quite a funny guy, he's really nice, um, he's gotten really involved with the students and his project is Extraordinary, that's his title of the project. So he was there last month and he's working with the students all year and then he'll be giving them the degrees at the end of the year. So it's quite a cool project, very different to last year. Um, my graduating year was a company called M&M. They're a graphics design company that did the Bjork front covers with all that melting black text. Um, they're basically the most famous graphic design duo in Paris. They have five people working for them and they're really funny. So they were my class presidents. They were quite cool. A bit quirky, but very cool. Um, um, and then we've, these are just some of the examples of the projects I really liked. So last year we did the Hermes windows. Um, the picture's not that great, I'm sorry, the resolution didn't work, but our students, for the opening of the equestrian show that they do for three years every year at the Stade de l'Enchant, Hermes um, does window displays, and they, our students did three of their window displays, and I think they're just amazing. Like, I went to see them on the Avenue Georges V, and I just thought it was incredible. These are second-year students and third-year students doing a project, and they went to the atelier, they went to the studios, they went to the boutiques, they worked with Hermes and the head of communications, and they did this project in their second and third year, not even final year. So these are the kind of things that we're doing to help students. You can see the, the sort of projects, and this was one of the windows. I'm sorry, um, are those group projects? These were group projects. So these were communication design, fashion design, and design management students. Very cool. Yeah, it's a really cool project. And it's so important to do group projects because it's, some people find it really hard. It was the thing for me, I'm such a control freak. Doing a group project is the hardest thing ever. So it's, it's, it's actually quite a good thing to just be doing from the word go. We do it from foundation all the way through. Um, and this was quite cool. This is a bit different. This was design management. And I might just point out now, actually, that design management is a little bit different. It's a business degree. All the other degrees are fine arts degrees, including the history of art degree, but design management is a four-year business degree, and you don't have to have a portfolio to apply. Uh, I mean, you can ask me about that afterwards, but I just thought I'd lay that out before I explain this project, because it's a bit different. So we worked with EDF, massive company. We went to their headquarters, and we had to give a presentation, and I went, and I was, I was terrified, and I wasn't even giving the presentation. And basically, it was called the Sustainable Design Challenge. 20 universities, international schools, including the University of Arts London, from all over the world, we won, which was really exciting. We won the prize. Um, as a result, our students were offered a 5,000 euro grant to develop their research. And they're now developing the project with EDF and RATP, which is um, basically the Transport for London in Paris. And it, their idea was to use, I can't say the word. It's when the impact of objects and materials, it's SISO something with P and, and that creates energy and that energy is used as a sustainable energy resource and they developed this idea to, with communication design students to convert Châtelet Les Halles metro station into a sustainable economic structure, um, um, not economic, ecological structure. You can see I'm not a design management student, it's pathetic isn't it? Um, and, um, and they basically did, as you can kind of see in the plan over here, convert it and they're now working on actually making it a reality. I mean, how many students can say they've done that whilst they're studying? So these were third and fourth year students, so in your last two years. Um, really, really exciting project and it's still going on now. Um, fashion students, every year we work with a fashion company, they come in, they give a challenge to students and the winning student gets their product made. Third year students, really exciting. 
So we've done it with Balmain, we've done it with Hermes, Balenciaga. This year we did it with American Retro, which is much more mainstream. And I was quite surprised at the choice um, because we normally work with the couture companies. But actually, it was the most exciting project we've done because the students didn't get to design one thing, they got to design an entire look. Um, and that was then sold in the stores. So that's a whole other kettle of fish. That was really exciting last year. Um, and then we have visiting lecturers. So next, no, in two weeks' time, um, we have a series of sculptors coming in to talk to students. Um, and I'm going to forget all their names, so I have a note written down, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, and I have to remember, I've taken the wrong piece of paper, so you're just going to have to bear with me. Um, I shall tell you the names afterwards, because they're all new. Um, so we have a series of sculptors coming in, working with our students and just giving lectures, basically. Um, so these are normally just one-day visits, um, but they're, they're, they're quite an exciting thing. And we do that for all the different degree choices. So for fashion, we have lecturers, for communication design, for illustration, photography, everything. Um, and that's throughout the year from foundation onwards. Um, and then I just thought I'd put this list. Um, I, I selected out, there's about 200 companies on it, but over the last two years, we make, we've created a list of all the companies our students have done internships at. And this includes, which is quite exciting, includes foundation students. So even off our first year students are allowed to do internships, not during their studies because it's a much more concentrated program in the first year, but in the, um, during fashion week, design week, and in their holidays. So if you want to, and students normally come to us, I'd say it's about 15% of the foundation students that do it, but we get them in there going straight from the first year. And then obviously our third year students, pretty much all of them, do an internship, and fourth year students if they have time. So um, this is just a list. Does anyone have any questions about internships? Do we normally have to take a gap year for an internship? Like, Depends uh, on the internship. Um, yeah. Not normally, no, because we, base, we purposefully, the way that we do internships is that we actually offer them to the students, which is something you should be looking for, and, 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 um, and that is, uh, is, makes it easier for you to say, well, I want to do an internship, but I want to do it in my free time. So that would mean evenings, or one day a week, or weekends, or during fashion week, or during your holidays. If you want to take a year off and do an internship, I had friends that did that because they did a part-time internship. The company loved them so much, they said, would you like to work for us for a year? And they said, yeah, and we gave them a year off and they did it. Often in fashion, that's the case. Yeah. It's really, of all the degrees, it's the most important one for work experience. So, yeah. They, they don't pay you They actually do some of them. Internships, if you do for a year off, yes, they have to pay you. In France, it's illegal not to pay a student, and they have a higher minimum wage than here. Um, what internship means is that you go work for them, but they don't pay you, really. Yeah, it's, it, in France, it's a little bit different. Um, it's illegal for them to employ you without paying you, unless it's a short internship, for example, Fashion Week, where you do it for free, because we arrange it. We have uh, all of the fashion companies that are on here do Fashion Week with us, so they say we need three students. So we put up a notice, and we say we need three students, first three students to come who want to work for Dior, come now. Um, and um, you don't get paid for that, but they normally give you something at the end of it. So my friend did three of them, so she's got like a pair of Oscar de la Renta shoes that are amazing, that I would kill for, and she's got a bag and things like that, so they're pretty nice. Um, and, um, and if you do it for a year, most companies pay you some better than others, that's the reality of it. Some will pay you really well, some will pay you minimum, some will pay for your transport and your food, and then a little bit extra. So we try to sort of fight to get you the best deal we can if you really want to work for a company and take a year off. Any other questions about internships? No? I think I've only got like one slide left. Oh, so I've just got three examples of students, but I'm, I'm, are we okay for time? Is everybody all right? You're not totally bored or phased out yet? Would you like to see some examples of students that have graduated recently and what they've done? So these are actually f friends of mine, so I particularly specifically pick people that I know or that I've worked with, because I know exactly the trajectory that they took during their studies and after they graduated. So Noor is a friend of mine from Lebanon. We studied together, she was a fashion design major, and I was in the studio next to her in my fine arts studio. Um, she came from Lebanon, she did four years full in Paris, so she didn't do a study abroad year because she was the one that worked with Oscar de la Renta, and she worked with quite a few companies, and she had such good opportunities that she stayed. And she got her first job after graduating through another friend of mine in the school that had done an internship at a company called Damir Doma, and that comp she'd done it as a design management student doing their PR. Nor really liked the company. She said, can you get me an interview? She went, and they, 
again, it's networking. They were chatting over coffee. I was there when it happened. And I suggested, you know, why don't you talk to Laura? She talked to Laura. Laura offered her um, the interview opportunity. And she went and she got her first job. She worked there for a year and a half, being a seamstress, doing the pattern cutting, working her way up. And then after a year and a half, she moved back to Lebanon to start her own company. Now, that's really quick. Most fashion design students will work in a company for 10 to 15 years after they graduate before they even consider starting their own label. It's a very difficult thing to do, but it's a real testament to how confident our students are because the idea of, I mean, she had to move home to do it. It cost, you know, it costs money to start your own label, but she made that sacrifice because she wanted to start her own label and she's already done her first collection. She's already selling it in shops. She graduated three years ago with me. So within three years, she's already selling her first collection in stores in Lebanon and online. So that's already, that's a massive step in fashion. And um, she has a good CV and she'll basically be coming back to Paris next year to start doing her collection in Paris. So it's a good example of someone, I've got some pictures of her work, it's a good example of someone who's confident enough to take that risk. You know, she doesn't have a job in Lebanon, but she's, she's investing the money she earned while she was in Paris and starting her own label. Um, she's living in her parents' house, which I'm sure is sacrifice enough. Um, and um, she's just connecting with people on blogs, getting her work out there. Every week she's got something online. And that's another thing. It just comes from being in a university where we're exposed to these kind of things. Um, uh, another example, um, this is Anthony Johan. So he's an Indonesian student, um, came to do a fine arts degree and sculpture degree, um, but actually had a background in graphic design. Um, I remember him standing outside one day um, at the front door talking to the woman that was doing the catalogue for our, our end of year catalogue. They were just having a coffee and chatting in the front door. And she, she said, what do you think you want to do after you graduate? He was, he was actually in the process of hanging his final show and he did about 400 ceramic pieces and they were on a wall. And I was helping him put them all on the shelves. Um, and she said, what do you want to do after you graduate? And he said, well, I actually think, you know, I think I'd really like to, to, to build my career in art direction as opposed to doing fine arts. You know, I love sculpting, I love drawing, but I really think that's, that's where my skills lie and that's what I want to do. And she said, well, I've got a friend that works at Ogilvy and Mother. Do you want to meet her for a coffee and see if they've got any opportunities? Um, he got a job working at Ogilvy and Mother, an internship, right at the bottom, um, working in the design studio, doing design for all the miscellaneous projects. He made friends, he got chatting, he's a very confident guy, um, worked his way up, started working with a guy called Christian that basically does all of the 2D work for Louis Vuitton. So he started working under him and they then proceeded to do the three projects in a row for Louis Vuitton. So every Christmas Louis Vuitton project you've ever seen, any voyage, any images with celebrities, any books they've ever done, brochures, that was basically Anthony and this guy. So within two years of graduating, he just found his way to something he really wanted to do. And I know he's a really single-minded guy. And he thought, I want to work in luxury. I want to work in art direction. He started right at the bottom. It's not an easy thing to do. But once you, once you get in somewhere and you've had that experience, you work your way up. And so within three years, he was doing all of the videos and production for Louis Vuitton. He did, these are a handful of the projects that he worked on. So they went out to shoot in Mexico. Um, he's worked with a lot of directors. Um, and this was a film that he made, a series of films that you can find on YouTube. So if you're interested in looking, they're really beautiful. They're called Savoir Faire by Louis Vuitton. And it's by a photographer called Bruno Aveillon that's currently doing a version of Cinderella in Hollywood. But he came to work with them. Anthony worked with him. And as a result, eight months ago, he quit his job at Ogilvy and started a company with this guy, Bruno Aveillon, that's just about to start. And it's luxury art direction. And they're working with some of the biggest companies in luxury fashion. So within three years and a half, four years of graduating, he's managed to start his own company. And it's not luck, it's not money, it's not any of those things. It's purely knowing what he wants to do, being really confident, and, and just meeting the right people. You know, you can meet 10 people in a day. If you know what you want, the right person, will, you'll end up having a good conversation and you pursue it. So he's one of my sort of star examples of someone that's, you know, gotten what they wanted, even though he did a fine arts degree. So you never really know. Um, and then my last example is Georgia. I don't know if any of you have seen her work. She did a recent collaboration with River Island. She's doing a second one this month. So she was a fashion design student, did much the same as Noor. She worked for a year and a half, and then she came back to London. She's from, she's from England. Um, started her own label. She's now in her sixth collection. She graduated in the same year as Anthony, so it's five years ago. Um, and and uh, she's had her collections on London Fashion Week, Paris Fashion Week, this is from her website, so this is her current collection. 
Um, and she's just been all over the shop. I mean, this is some of her, uh, her clothes are just everywhere. Everywhere I look, I see her designs. Um, and um, it's really exciting. She did a, a collaboration with Victoria's Secret and Swarovski two years after graduating um, on the 2010 Victoria's Secret catwalk. Um, and then this is her, was her River Island collection a year and a half ago. Um, so they did a really beautiful video, of which I don't think I have a, I don't have a picture of it, but it was this girl and this, these people drank. It's amazing. And so she's done this, so they did this collection, then they did the River Island with Rihanna collection, and then they're doing her collection again. So she graduated five years ago, and um, yeah, she's really good at what she does. She won our sort of top student award when she graduated, but she took a risk and she came back here and she started her own label. And yes, I'm not going to deny that it takes skill. You do have to be really good at what you do. But I th I'd hope that everything I've kind of said has shown how much sort of confidence and exposure really plays a part in those opportunities. So those are my kind of case studies. I've talked a lot and I've got a really dry throat. So I'm going to shut up. And uh, does anyone have any other questions? No. Oh. It's a good point for me to stop, probably. When do we apply? <laughs> how do you apply? Well, I had, I had that. Because how does one apply? How does one apply? No. Um, <laughs> I, uh, <coughs> I had a third presentation that we decided was just a bit too much for a Monday evening at 6 p.m. Um, but it basically was about how to apply and some example portfolios. I mean, I, the quick lowdown is, is just um, you apply mostly online for American universities. Application form, portfolio, everything like that, you upload it all online. Um, and then we give you a call and do an interview unless you come to Paris maybe for an open house day. We try to encourage students to do that, so to apply before open house, but then to come and do the interview, um, or to do the interview when you come and then apply straight afterwards, for example. Um, it's pretty easy with us. In America, obviously, it's a little bit more difficult. Bigger universities don't do interviews, so you've really got to sell yourself on the stuff you would submit online. Whereas with us, it's a little bit more one-on-one, -on -one, so you've got a chance to kind of explain what you've put in, who you are, to elaborate. British universities, I don't know if they do interviews anymore. Um, I think their application process now for foundation is pretty strict, um, and I think most of it's online as well. You upload your images online. So one of my biggest points in that presentation was photograph your work really well, because everything is digital. How many people are for a place there? To us? At, at us? Yeah. Um, I don't know the percentage for last year, because I'm not in Paris anymore and no one told me. Um, but it's normally about... 30 to 40 percent acceptance rate. Now that's really high. The reason that it's high with us, it sounds like we don't have a lot of applicants, and that's kind of half the truth. Um, we have more applicants than we need, but a lot of people get halfway through the application and change their minds because it's an expensive school or because it's in Paris or because they're not, you know, it's a very specific choice. So we're quite lucky in that the people that complete the applications, you know, they really want to come. So they've just got to be good by that point. Now, in the last year, it, we've had loads of British students applying, as you can imagine, because the fees have gone up in the UK. So they're looking to opportunities closer. I mean, Paris is two hours away on train, two and a half hours away on the train. So it's quite, and we're the only English-speaking school. So you can imagine, I would imagine our percentage is a little lower this year in terms of how many of the applicants are accepted. But it's still pretty good compared to a university with like, you know, the UAL gets like, thousands and thousands of applicants for not so many places and their courses are already pretty full so you know there's something to be said for looking at the smaller universities or at the American universities if you can get a scholarship because you're you, you're in a slightly smaller number of applicants for now I think in the next five years it might shift so it's an interesting time any other questions I think, I mean, I might be coming back to do some portfolio stuff. I don't know if you want to... Uh, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to invite Kate back in to maybe some of your art lessons at another time to look at your portfolios. And if you've got more questions, then you can ask them. OK? <laughs> I mean, you don't. This, oh no, you guys definitely don't. It's not that you have to show me your work. It's just that one of the, my jobs is actually I'm, I am a portfolio developmental person at our university. So not just for applying to us. I mean, I can give you perfect advice if you want to apply to study with us. But even if you want to apply to study in the UK or study in America, I've seen, I don't know how many portfolios I've seen and also how many applications I made when I was a student. And I really do know how to build a good portfolio, what people are looking for now. 
um, you know, how to lay it out, how to edit it. I, I have a presentation about it, but actually these are things that are more helpful when I'm looking at your work. And it's not something to be embarrassed about. Like, it's so, so helpful. I wish I had someone that wasn't necessarily my art teacher that knew me coming and looking at my work. Because when you have an outsider's point of view and they just got their, your work in front of them, they're going to give you the same opinion that someone at university is going to give you that's never seen your work before. So it's extremely, extremely helpful. So don't be afraid if I come back. I'm not being nosy, I promise. <laughs> no. But it, 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 might, it, it could be a really good opportunity. Um, and it is something I'm good at. I don't often say that, so... Yeah. OK, I think we should give you a rest there now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kate. Thanks for coming and talking to us. Thanks, guys. Thank you.